we are going to be talking about partnering partnering with brands. And basically, I'm not sure um, if all of you are aware of the Collective One Spaces, which is the company that I'm representing here today. Mm -hmm. uh, we're opening up down the hall. If anybody wants a tour afterwards, I do. Oh, yes, of course, our lovely um, Caesar Stone Rep is here. Hi. You can see her after if you need slaps. <laughs> 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 So we're a co-working space for designers, decorators, and the like, and basically anybody in the creative industry. So we are excited to be a part of the TIDC, and we're also excited to be partners with um, a lot of our panel today. Um, so we're just going to be kind of covering what partnerships are like, and basically what that looks like for the future of the design industry. Uh, we will be having questions towards the end, so if you do have questions, feel, please feel free to make note of them. Um, if you have a question for one of the panels, panelists, you can definitely raise your hand like in school, and I'm sure they'll be able to answer the questions for you, okay? So, um, <clears throat> without further ado, I'm going to let Stephen start off by introducing the company that he works with, which is Rockpal, um, which is out in Oshawa. So, go ahead, Stephen. Hi there. Can you hear me? So, uh, Rock Pile Custom Cabinets is a, a manufacturing company for fine custom cabinetry. Anything wood and wood related products we manufacture at our facility in Oshawa. Um, we've also just uh, embarked on opening up a 12,000 square foot uh, showroom which kind of fits in very good with the timing of this here and our association with uh, the collective in partnering with uh, different brands. Um, because we're in the East, uh, having a presence in Toronto in the design district is uh, critical for exposing uh, who we are to the masses across the board and especially in the industry. Designers that we wouldn't normally see, we now get to touch. And um, that's kind of our whole business model, is that we've created this uh, kitchen experience where you can come into our environment and experience the heart of the home, which is the kitchen and what we've built. Everything that we've done in our showroom represents um, the partnering of the elite brands out there. And um, one, of, one of my associates on the panel here, um, uh, Rhythm, um, we, we, we partnered with exposing um, one of his brands in our environment. So it's just, um, for us, we want our, our designers, our contractors, our builders, our architects to come into a space where they don't have to go anywhere else. They come into the space and they're able to get access to the elite uh, brands. It's a very narrow market and um, they'll be able to do everything in a, in a one-stop shop environment. Thank you. And I can attest to how beautiful the showroom is. Um, I did a tour there after I joined the collective and um, it's worth the drive to Oshawa. <laughs> <laughs> so next up we have Jennifer. Hi, um, sorry, my throat's dry. I'm Jen Mater. I am coming at this from probably more the client and marketing side of it versus necessarily the brand or vendor. I've worked at media agencies on brand partnerships with companies like Home Depot and Colin and Justin or content integrations and more of um, kind of like a more mass media approach. But then at my time at House and Home, I also worked with brands such as yourselves in terms of aligning partnerships with our own brand, whether that be House and Home or certain personalities, depending on what the fit was within the category. So I kind of have a bit of a different lens, I think, that maybe um, some of my colleagues here. But look forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Next up is Rhythm. Hi, everyone. My name is Rhythm. Um, as for the origin story, the way I got into the industry five years ago, was through a company that co-founded with my dad, Mayo. We are a luxury lifestyle brand. Um, and we started with working with designers as brand partners. And that's 
a topic that I really care about, and my other company, Guidant, is an influencer marketing platform bringing influencer marketing to the home industry. And we are basically building the framework and infrastructure required for these partnerships to take place between brands and designers. Thank you. Thanks. Rebecca? Hi, I'm, I'm Rebecca Hay, and I'm an interior designer here in Toronto. My firm, Rebecca Hay Designs, it's very loud, does, um, uh, we do residential design across the city and into Muskoka. And I have lots of experience working behind the scenes in television. You mentioned that early in my career. I worked with Property Brothers, Scott Gilbrey, um, and then branched out on my own about eight years ago. And we have partnered with we have partnered with brands. Uh, I'm interested to hear everyone else's take on it. I feel like I'm still a bit of a baby at this um, whole concept, so I'm interested to hear and share my experience. I also recently, when the pandemic hit, started a podcast for designers. I love to talk about business. As uh, some ladies here who are part of my coaching community, we have online courses. Uh, you guys are the best, by the way. And I cried when I saw you walking there. I'm like, oh, you're supporting me. Um, even if you're not here for me, this is good. I'll go with that. Um, and so I have a podcast, Resilient by Design, where I like to talk about business and all things like this. So I love to share with the design community here in Toronto and abroad. And, um, and it's just been really great to sort of help other designers who maybe are not quite as far along in their journey and share everything that I'm learning. So I'm excited to be a part of the panel. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. So without further ado, I'm going to start off with the questions. Um, so out the gate, we're looking at what is the reason for partnering with brands? So essentially, we can, we can look at partnerships from different angles, um, whether it is something that we reach out from the collective, we reach out to Rockpile, we partner with them to be uh, in our space. So, so if you haven't been to our current location, you'll see the fantastic kitchen that we've built out with Rockpile. Um, so that's one element that you could look at for partnering. Um, it works, like Stephen mentioned, because they're out in Oshawa, we're in kind of central Toronto, and we're also going to be featuring them here in our new space as well. So there's different angles, um, and I think obviously everybody's going to have a different spin on this. So who would like to go first and answer that question? I can go first. Perfect. Um, so I think partnering with brands starts with today, everybody that is online has a social profile, has a digital channel, is on YouTube, is on Instagram, is on TikTok is a brand in itself and partnering with brands is basically working together collaboratively to expanding each other's reach and the reasons designers specifically should partner with brands is so that not only they are putting their own brand outside to a bigger reach when working with bigger brands that are out there they're also opening themselves to different revenue streams that Rebecca, for example, started with building a podcast, right? So building a podcast also brings in partnering with brands because you're bringing in other designers, you're bringing in another brands and interviewing them and that in a digital space is a partnership and that helps you with your main business of interior design. Right, the, co the collective happens to be a sponsor of my podcast, thank mm -hmm. you very much. And that's a partnership where I, in exchange for using their beautiful space, which is their podcast booth, um, I they get to sponsor and I get to share how much I love them. And it's a partnership that's not monetary in that sense, but that helps both of us uh, get the word out about what we're doing. Right? Exactly. Can I jump in? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's open and, floor. Yeah, to kind of... <laughs> Build on what Radam said from a client perspective, you know, when designers get to a point where you have an audience or a brand that has some scale um, or has a certain aesthetic or has a certain notoriety, um, you know, Sarah Richardson's an excellent, excellent example of this, you know, she reaches a lot of, and I'm going to say it, suburban moms in Oakville. <laughs> I'm like, you know, there are brands that want that demographic and they align with her and I think that's why she's had a lot of success on a mass scale. I know when I worked on brands and we were looking at influencers, not in the design space, but in this, the um, consumer packaged goods, 
it was a granola bar and we wanted a certain demographic with young kids, so we would tap into platforms such as um, what Redam had mentioned. There are some other ones out there and you could find those audiences. Um, so I think from your perspective, as your audiences grow, connecting with platforms and making yourself available can also open up revenue streams. For sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, just to add to all that, uh, scale is a big thing in this industry. And um, I mean, from left to right, north to south, you can see kitchen cabinet companies all over the place. But what's different? Who, who are they aligning with strategically, not only to support their brand, but the brand, the brands of the other people that they're associated with, the other businesses that they're associated with? Mayo, for example, uh, Flooring, Siad, Cosentino, brands like that, these already have a following, they have, they already have alignment. So bringing those together helps support the industry so that you know that you're clearly defined within that industry. Another point I want to like talk about is like not not all of us here are you know Sarah Richardson. Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't have opportunities as nano influencers, as micro influencers. As you start gathering, you know, anywhere from 3,000 followers onwards, you still have a very targeted audience. And brands want that, brands need that because you're in California or you're in, let's say, um, somewhere in Alberta, give me a city. Uh, Edmonton. Edmonton. Edmonton, right? So brands that are locally in Edmonton and brands that are not there, they still have an audience that could potentially buy their product. And you have that targeted audience. So this is how you can start you know, putting yourself out there knowing and understanding your own metrics and your own audience pool that you have a really deep connection with. They are following you, they are watching you, for at least home inspiration. Like if all of us over here are designers. Are we? All designers in the house? Some of them? Give me a raise of hands. Designers. Or decorators. Or decorators, okay. Cool. Majority. Majority. So, you know you guys, how many of you guys have more than 10,000 followers? <laughs> so you guys will often wonder, but why am I here? What brand is going to partner with me? Right? Like, and brands on the other end are also trying to now open up their own options. Not everybody can throw in, you know, 50 grand, 100 grand on a big influencer. But they do want that reach. They do want to gradually extend uh, their audience in the pool that they can tap into. And that's where nano and micro influencers come in. Perfect, thank you. I'm done speaking. What's the you're, difference? You're allowed to continue. <laughs> Rita, I have a question. What's the difference between a nano and a micro influencer? So, a micro influencer is anywhere between 10 to 100K. And a nano it's is just in the middle of ten. Instagram followers, what you're talking Instagram, about? Instagram, TikTok, yeah. I would like YouTube, okay. social media. Yeah. That's a micro. What's a nano, or are they the same? I think anything below ten thousand followers is it nano. It's nano. So the, 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 the <laughs> more the numbers, what really means about like these influencers is that they're targeted reach. So when you're a macro influencer, over 100,000 followers, brands that are going after maximum reach and have the budget, of course, can go after and often working with macro influencers. For micro, you want more loyal, targeted audience. And same with nano, that's even more local-based, local businesses uh, you know, that are doing business and often, you know, working with local audiences and local designers, local decorators, for them, nano influence is perfect because that's where your audience is. Nobody, if you're in Toronto, nobody's gonna come here to your offline showroom and buy from you know, Calgary from you. 
So, but people that are in GTA are most likely being influenced by that nano and micro influencer. I would say as a nano micro influencer. I so. a micro influencer. You Ooh. could probably add up all your different <laughs> social medias together. I just said And you do have yeah. a strong influencer. Right? Um, but I would say that for like those of you who are here thinking, well, that's really nice to have 10,000 followers to Ridham's point. You are an influencer even without having that title. You don't need to be paid in product or in financial, in money to be considered an influencer. Every single person in this room, you are influencing your community, you are influ influencing your colleagues. How many designers on Instagram notice that they're followed by a lot of designers, right? You are influencing all of those colleagues that are in competition with you and want to see what kitchen company you're using and it's really beneficial for brands and I think I mean I'm gonna go on a minute of a tangent here is that I think especially as women because I see mostly women in this room and I know from you know all the designers that are in our community that it's the predominantly women that oftentimes we sell ourselves short we don't think that we are at a level uh, that is good enough, or we don't have enough followers to approach a brand um, about a partnership, to approach a magazine perhaps about getting published. So I think that what I want to reiterate is that you have that influence. People are following you. It's not just potential clients. And what I will add is that it's not, also it's not just about being an influencer. Right? Like we're not, I'm in, my goal is not to be an influencer. I'm trying to grow this incredible business. I don't want to be a paid influencer for a living. That is not my goal. However, when you partner with brands, and in my, in my experience, what it has done is it has elevated my company locally and with those partners and within our design community, right? When I look back to how I was when I started, I mean, nobody knew who I was. I don't think everybody knows, but enough people know that it's elevating my brand and it's helping to attract the clients that I want to bring to my business. So it's one more step I see when you can partner with a great company, a great product company, maybe it's even a service company. I've partnered with home organizers before who came into my house and they helped me organize the basement, the, the bathroom, and then she gets business in exchange for that. There's always an exchange of service. And I think we're talking a lot big, big picture and, oh, let's get paid $10,000. Well, shoot, I still have yet to be paid for really any influencer type work. It's been more of an exchange of service, right? I will provide you with access to my platform or I will talk about it with my community. And in exchange, you will provide me with potentially a product, it might be a service, it might be just a great discount. It's not always uh, monetary. I know that would be well, a dreamy goal, but I don't say. yeah. I definitely agree with you. I think that's that's where we headed in you know this internet 3.0, social media 3.0. It is everybody here has influence, like Rebecca said, and everybody has data points that a lot of bigger companies have been monetizing on. But now there are tools out there, like, you know, I'm gonna give a shout out to Surf, that a tool that everybody should uh, download. It's a Google extension where whenever you're surfing, any products that you are looking at, any data that you're sharing, you get rewards for that. And those rewards can be used, again, partnership with brands to buy different things. What's it called? Surf. S-U-R-F? Yeah. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Surf. So yeah, like everybody does have an influence and I'm pretty sure, you know, like I've seen some of my friends that have less than 500 followers. I see them wearing Lululemon shorts and I'm like, well, I, I want to get them. That's influence, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, finding the right partnerships, how would you guys go about doing that? I mean, I can jump right in because I've been very actively trying to find partners to work with me on a farmhouse that I'm building. So if you guys know of anyone, let me know. <laughs> um, but I would say what's so important, I think, is partnering with brands that you already respect and ideally work with. Um, you know, when you can stand behind a product because you know that it's good and you love it, then you will have more influence 
and it'll be more successful partnership. I've been approached by brands to promote their product, but I don't think that they are eco-friendly enough because I'm very passionate about the environment, for anyone who knows me, and I've turned down potential collaborations or free gifted product because I, I don't think it's reflective of my brand and the message I'm trying to send out there. So I think it's important that when you partner with, let's say, Mayo, because you love their hardware, which is beautiful, by the way, um, then that's a true representation of the type of hardware you would use in a project. You would already naturally put it forward. So when you go to approach that company, A, they already know who you are because you've worked with them. You have a personal relationship. And B, they will see that value because they already understand and know your brand. Great. So I'm just going to touch on that because Rebecca and I, um, we basically met last That's year we met. at Upper Canada, That's where we formerly used to work at, and we essentially had a partnership. So Rebecca was working on her home, as many of her followers would know, um, and she approached us for hardware, and again, it was very much a strong collaboration between the two of us. We got some airtime of this on the video with Rebecca, which was fun. Go follow the video, <laughs> Hey Home Reno, on my Instagram. <laughs> Wayne is a feature. There you go. <laughs> Um, so that's that's one that's one element like you're saying you already have that established connection and you're continuing to build and grow and you know it worked out for both of us. So. Can I I'll say one more thing about that? Yeah. Um, I'll let someone else speak. But I think to answer your question directly, mm -hmm. how do you approach them? Because I think that's probably what a lot of people are thinking. Like that sounds really nice, but like what am I going to do? Walk up to you know Rhythm and say, hey, can you want to partner with me? Yes. You have to first, I would say, like literally bring it right down to the, the nuts and bolts. You go in person to the person that you work with, this, sorry, this vendor that you work with or the supplier or the company you want to partner with. And you say, hey, listen, would you be interested in partnering with me? Oh, that's interesting. Tell me what it would be. And you can explain it. And then you can follow up with an email. I've sometimes sent emails when I already have a good working relationship. So with Upper Canada Specialty Hardware, I believe I sent you guys an email. We were like, listen, we're doing this thing. Would you be interested in partnering with us? This is what we're looking for. We're doing, you know, interior doors, and this is the product that I love. You know, let me know. It could be mutually beneficial. And it's just a nice, friendly email. And the worst thing they can say is no. Which they didn't. <laughs> Which they did, but it does happen a lot. And if you don't ask, you don't know, right? right. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to add to that because I thought you hit something um, that was important to mention. Partnering with brands when it's disingenuous doesn't do anybody any favors. Like it doesn't do your brand any favors. And if I'm coming to you as a marketer and, you know, maybe I haven't chosen you, um, maybe I don't know enough about you when I chose you or when I was aligned with you on a platform necessarily. Um, that maybe there's a bit of a misfit because what happens is and I've been in this situation I'm like there's backlash so I'm like and you know you might lose lose some of your audience the brand that you partnered with is going to get bad PR or some backlash or you know negative comments on social so I think you know staying true to yourself and finding the right opportunities in the end would be the most successful option yeah, be authentic. Yeah. Um, in, in, in my experience and our experience putting together what what we've done, which which spanned a long time and took over five years to get to what we have now and the partnerships that we've created now. So it's important to have a plan of who those partnerships you want to establish are. They need to align with your your strategic vision. It needs to align with how you want to put yourself out into the marketplace. And once you have that, then you can go to town as far as what Rebecca and Rhythm and everybody on the panel has been saying about reaching out. That's the only way you establish the connect is you have to go after what you want. And you know what? The first knock on the door may not get it for you. You may have to try two, three, ten times. But the fact of the matter is if you have your plan, work your plan, and you will establish what you need to get to what you want. 
add to that too. Of course. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I was just thinking, I'm like, I, I like where you're going with that. And I think if I was in your position and maybe it's a function of, you know, brainstorming all of the brands and then bucketing them into categories. Because one thing that will happen is if I'm a client um, and let's say I'm a paint company and I know that you've already worked with a competitor, that will count against you if you come to me. Do you know what I mean? And it depends on how recent that was. But the fact of the matter is you've already been exposed as their partner and there's residual kind of effect from my perspective. So to your point, having a strategy and then maybe hitting your top ones first. So I guess the question uh, would be like, what would a strategy look like for finding the right partner? I think first, you're just having a plan, uh, plan for yourself that what are you trying to achieve from this partnership and then really, like, uh, I'll give you an example. So we recently are working with a designer that is actually a nano-influencer, and surprisingly, none of the brands that we approached said no. And the reason was they had a plan. They put together a description of how their room's gonna look, why are they using these independent individual brands, and what, what are they trying to achieve with the storytelling they're about to do for this particular project. So this plan of what do you want, because you are, again, trying to be authentic for yourself, you're trying to represent yourself, your brand, and you're staying true, true, true to yourself. And having that plan systematically being put towards the brands that you're trying to reach out to, I, I think most of the brands actually don't care that much how many followers you have. As long as you can really create good content for them and that is authentic and that is gonna resonate with the audience. Because having content for brands is, is gold because that can be repurposed. Influence and you know followers reach, that's one thing. But having partners that are offending and are creating good quality content that brands can reuse towards different social channels has a lot of mileage. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know we keep talking a lot about Instagram, but I, I want, for those of you who are like, well, I'm not really on Instagram, because I know that there's probably people in this room who feel that way. It's not just about social media. I mean, I know for me, pre-pandemic, um, you know, I would have brands that I would partner with to do a stage talk. So maybe I would go do something like this, right? Or I would do go and speak at a home show. And, and the brand would sponsor my talk, and they would either give me money, or they would give me an exchange for product towards a project I was working on, in exchange for me, them having their, their name right there, the collective, right? So there's lots of other opportunities that are not just social media. Anybody else? No? Okay. <laughs> um, so basically the next question would be, how do you align your goals and your revenue stream with partnerships? It's a loaded one. It's a loaded one. <laughs> talk about it from a client perspective? Sure, go for it. Um, well, I can talk about it from, I guess, two perspectives, both like publisher as well as client. Um, I think there's definitely like a quality quotient, like you don't want to partner with someone on either side that's gonna under per, create a perception of a lower value of what your brand may be. Like don't compromise just for the sake of a sale because I think whatever that perception and image that goes out into the world, especially if it does end up on social or in some form of content, is permanent. <laughs> I'm like, when people Google your brand, like there's there's a, a high likelihood that that might appear. Um, in terms of aligning revenue, I think, like I know from the publisher standpoint, often it's aligned with, you know, the potential exposure for your brand as well as the physical or like hard costs on our end. So, you know, in the case of, you know, you're doing an event, how much of your time is involved, you know, is there signage, are there hard costs? Like you want to make sure you're recouping all of that with whatever value you're receiving um, in return. Can you ask the question again? Sure. <laughs> so how do you align your goals and your revenue stream through partnerships? That's a hard, I don't, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that question That's because okay. I don't know that revenue goals to think of uh, partnerships bringing in enough revenue to be sort of a revenue stream, I'm not there yet, so I can't even imagine what that would look like. I think that would be nice. Um, it, it to me is, it supplements what is my regular income, which is interior design clients, right? But I would say, and this is maybe not the right thing to say, but I 
love partnering with brands more for the street cred that it gives me than any financial, um, uh, what's the word when someone pays you? Gain. Thank you, gain. It's been a while, guys. It's not <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> it really has. And, and then, I mean, so much of getting published or just being out there, and like, you guys know I talk about this a lot in Momentum, but it's, it's really street cred. It's people in your industry and your clients seeing you and seeing what you're doing. Oh, wow, she's partnered with, uh, I keep using bio because you're sitting right next to me, but she's partnered with KitchenAid. Wow, if KitchenAid thinks that she should, she must be good. Oh, she got featured in House and Home Magazine. Wow, if House and Home's featuring her, she must be good. And the joke of it is, and we know this, our, the insider scoop is that it doesn't mean that that person is any better or more gifted than you are, right? It's completely about perception. So for me, it's not really been about the revenue as much as it is um, elevating my brand and expanding my reach so that I can attract those clients and ideally partnering with the brands that continue to level up so that I can continue to level up and get the higher paying clients and the bigger projects. Yeah, I was just, I'm nodding at you a lot. <laughs> so I'm like, yes, yes, all of that. But I think it's um, also a function of, instead of the word revenue in your question, it's the value. Like what is right. the value you're looking for? Because you're right, on more of a grassroots level, it's not gonna be like, you know, making bank on, on these partnerships. But I think the more exposure, the more clients, the more brands looking at you, um, the bigger social followings, it all works holistically. It's so all the compounded effect that you have with, you know, doing these partnerships, the street credit value that you get, and the other brands and other designers, and all the perceived value that you're creating around your brand, and how well together it's put together. That whole package for Rebecca Hay Designs is is a huge perceived value now. So any brand in the future that wants to partner with them. Even if the followers doesn't justify the cost of that particular creator as a designer, the perceived value does, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's what you're building over time, and it's compounding. So one collaboration from one project might not be, you know, like talking numbers, thousand dollars, but five, 10 projects in a year can amount to $20,000. And as you're growing your audience over time and the exposure you're getting, it's all compounding. So I'm gonna I'm gonna speak from a a different perspective. Um, as a as a kitchen manufacturer and aligning with brands as a kitchen manufacturer, the residual effects of that is to make sure that your your rate of return on those partnerships align with your vision first and foremost, and that you can see the potential rate of return on that partnership. So from a, a business in the industry that's producing goods, kitchens and um, millwork related products, the alignments that we strategize with, we have to roadmap to that partner what value can we anticipate from this partnership? And we have to put that down on paper. You have to know what that number is, the revenue side of the partnership. It's, it's critical because uh, for a company uh, like ours, you make an investment into something substantial like this and aligning with partnerships like the collective. Um, bringing those uh, brands together, there, there has to be an element of that that you, you map out that says, okay, um, my association with the collective is gonna give me scale. As a result of that scale, I should expect, because it's a house of designers, I should expect five jobs from that alignment and put a number to it for you to recognize your investment versus your rate of return for that investment. 
there is huge value in knowing that. And I do not want to take away from my friends on the panel here about um, not necessarily associating the partnership with the revenue, but it is critical from the position of the partnership that you take. Absolutely. I, I, I'm just like nodding because I just received an email from someone who partnered with us for my home renovation and they did some renderings for us. And they did a really great job and they did a few options for renderings and I posted it on social and I didn't have a formal agreement. They just offered to do them. And so I posted it on social and of course gave them their episodes coming out soon with all of their, um, with their renderings. And they sent me an email saying, thank you so much. We loved partnering with you. We've already received five new clients who told me that they, they heard of us through you. Whether it was through my Facebook group or my coaching community or my Instagram, that's a great, like to your point, that's a return that to be honest though, I wouldn't have been able to tell them Here's what your return is gonna be on doing these renderings. I can, all I can say is I have these outlets. I, you know, I have some influence, but I will do my best to put the word out about your product or service. I think it's hard for a designer to understand if you do my kitchen, how many more kitchens you'll get, right? But I do think that this, the better end of this deal is for the brand. I really do because I've seen it and I see how designers follow designers and like we're such influencers like I just want to say that again in on a micro nano scale um, because what like I saw it when I had 3,000 followers and I used an interiors photographer and of course I was posting all my photo shoots and I post a lot on Instagram so there's that but you know, I was posting the pictures and, and all these designers I didn't know. Oh, who did you use for your photo shoot? Oh, who was that? Oh, that was that person? And before I knew it, that photographer was the most sought after photographer. I mean, it seemed that way anyways, because she didn't have time for me at the time. Um, and she's so wonderful, I still work with her, but I just, I saw how it works so quickly from business to business for those brands. So I think that what that means is that that gives you a little bit of leverage. You think about, oh, I'm just a designer. I maybe have 1,500 followers. We don't do big projects like other designers. That doesn't matter. I think that there's still so much that can be gained from the brand partner on, the, on their end. Can I have something? Sorry, I was gonna say, I also think that, that it's also indicative to the category, like home renos and home design is a big investment, and if you're not, comfortable in the space like me as the audience, like that's exactly what's gonna happen, that I'm gonna reach out and try and get referrals. Um, and I also think there's like, you know, the level of quality of product and your experience, because surely if you're working with this person consistently, you've had a good experience, they haven't ripped you off, they're producing quality, quality outputs, like it's also, um, I guess, just more, what's the word, beneficial to this type of category. I wanna add in terms of designers, right? Like if you're talking numbers, um, for designers, when they are getting brand collaborations from their projects, if they're talking revenue and they're setting their own goals, one goal could be, okay, my cost shoot, my uh, project shoot is gonna cost me $2,000. Well, if I'm speaking about five different brands, I can cover that cost. And whatever I net on top of it is net positive. Tell everybody what you're doing. Did you not? No, sorry. Oh, no. What am I doing? Is that what you're doing? Uh, in terms of uh, Guidant? Okay. Yeah. For your, sure. So Your company. So Guidant, uh, we, we saw a lot of value that designers were bringing to the brands, right? We, I actually saw that with Maya myself, the numbers that we were seeing when designers spoke about our product, that People saw Jane's video, people saw our product in Rebecca's video, people saw this on this designer's uh, Instagram. And what I realized was this was all organic media that I was getting, but if I wanted to scale this up, I wanted to partner with designers and I wanted to incentivize them in order for them to, you know, see a benefit in what they're trying to do as well. Even though designers doing it for their own cloud, you know, for the, the reach that they'll get as well, but there is, always a cost to doing something, the cost of time, the cost of decorating, the cost of you know putting a photographer together, the cost of all these things, they add up. So when brands really incentivize designers to uh, create the content for them, to promote their brands, it 
it really helps the designer to invest more time into something like this. And I think because designers were not incentivized over time, they they kind of took it as like, okay, I'm just gonna create some content, I'm gonna post it on Instagram, I'm gonna tag a bunch of brands, and they'll reshare it and I'll get some credits out of it. But I think as as there's a shift in creator economy, more brands that are coming online, designers play a very, very important role. So the most recent acquisition of Shopify buying ePorto. I don't know how many guys have heard about that. Anybody? Sorry, buying what? ePorto from UK. So that, that's another sourcing platform where designers can source products. Um, Shopify buying a platform like this is helping again, you know, all these vendors and manufacturers in Europe, in UK, come online. And the more and more brands come online, they wanna work with designers because they're the creators of this industry. The kind of placements brands can get with designers as long-term partnerships over five, 10, 15 projects that designers are working on is very, very you know, advantageous for these brands. So we as Diet, as a platform, our job is to help them, help brands find designers that are using their products or incentivize designers to create content and grow online. So we wanna simplify the whole process of brand collaborations, brand new collaborations between designers, home influencers, design influencers, DIYers, and brands in the home industry. Thank you. Just stay tuned for, for more from Rita. Um, so to piggyback off of that, that is essentially the future of partnerships in the design industry. Um, but what are some other examples um, that you guys would see as a future of what that looks like for designers, decorators, in the industry partnering and kind of moving both uh, avenues forward for the partner and for the respective designer or decorator? I mean, I'm seeing that it's changed a lot. The the whole landscape in the few years that I've been, you know, running my business. I, when I started off working in television, it was everybody, every show that I worked on, and a few of you here have worked on these shows, you know, had all this Contra. And Contra was free product, essentially, that they would give to the Property Brothers. So they, we, Cutler was doing the kitchen. So they did all the kitchens for the entire series. And so there I am as the designer, like, okay, I, I worked with Cutler to make the kitchen for everyone, great. The same with all the brands. It's so many brands partnering with them. Now, fast forward to six years later, this year I worked briefly on a show again and it was a completely different landscape. And I kept asking the contra producer, I was like, well, like, who, who do you contra with? Like, where are we supposed to spec and pick things from? They're like, well, we had a deal, but it fell through, and we had this other deal, uh, and it's only gonna be for one episode, and we're still working on it. And I was like, wow, this is so different. Is this, is this typical, or is it just this show? And I was a little perplexed. Um, and and they, what I kept hearing over and over again is, it has changed because now brands are seeing that it's become so saturated in television and not as many people are watching, I'm assuming, they no one said that, but that's why I'm surmising. And what's happening is these brands are now getting just as much exposure from micro, nano, normal influencers. <laughs> I don't know if I should call someone who's not a nano. Um, and from these influencers online. So if you think of a kitchen company, they can supply a TV show for 24 episodes with appliances for 24 episodes, right? Or they could supply an interior designer with appliances for one episode slash one kitchen and get the same return on their investment because you are actually influencing people who are looking to you as the expert in what you do. They're people who are following Allah and they wanna know what kitchen company is she using? I love her work. Like you said, she's obviously vetted them. Like people probably message you all the time. Oh, who did you use? What was this thing, right? It's so much more impactful when you do it on this more micro niche sort of local scale. Like I think uh, smaller designers or I think designers that are not 100k plus are just gonna have a lot more opportunities now because just the example that they gave like they essentially have their own TV show they have all the tools for them out there to create their own TV show on IGTV and sitting from their home sitting from their office from their projects 
They have all these different avenues that they can use to help brands. And I think they're just gonna see a lot more opportunities as we move forward. Because it's their marketing budget, right? So you think, why would someone want to give me something? They're not human, they're not individuals giving you a carpet from their living room. This is a carpet company that has a budget allotted for the year to spend on marketing. Why not give you know Sarah a carpet that she can use one of her projects and, and she'll professionally photograph it, give them the photo, so there, boom, there's already, what, 1,500 bucks if you got like a full day good shoot? Um, it's a great return on investment. They don't have to stage the photo shoot. They don't have to think, well, how much work goes into a freaking photo shoot, right? It's your time, it's planning, it's prep, it's the cost. Just that alone is sometimes worth the return on the investment of the brand. Yeah, like, I think spending 100 grand on one collaboration instead of working with 20 different designers around North America in different states from the same budget is gonna get them a lot more reach and awareness locally with more highly targeted audience as compared to one TV network or one big tech collaboration. And it's, it's like a lot more content that you're getting from 20 people as compared to one person. Like I'm pretty sure we all used to just swiping, scrolling through Instagram and not really just looking at one person and being influenced by that one person. Like, I think we want to see different people. I think it's more impactful when we're seeing different people talk about the same brand as compared to one same person or a celebrity talking about that brand. I'm going to share something. I don't know if I'm allowed to share this, but my husband uh, is a, has his own marketing agency, and one of his clients is Simba Mattresses. And Simba Mattresses has launched and coming to Canada, and he's part of the marketing. He's their head of marketing for Canada, and they're trying to get the word out about these mattresses is becoming a very saturated industry. And so I said to him, like, why don't you use influencers? Like, I think that's a brilliant strategy. And I was like, well, I don't know, we'll see. Of course, I kept like badgering him, like, you gotta use the influencers. Like, it's the way to do it. Like, look at all these other companies. So he's like, okay, fine, we'll do this. We'll do the influencers. Like any husband, sometimes need to have a few reminders, and then finally they do it, and they say, that was such a great idea, I'm glad you made me do that. But he, that's just my, my husband, baby. But anyhow, so I, he asked me, give me some names of designers. And he said to me, I don't want the big ones. I don't want the ones with the 15,000 followers. Up to 10 is fine, maybe between five and 10. I gave him names of people that I thought would be good, and not whether they were good designers, but that I thought would be really good at spreading the word and sharing the product. People it was who, my mattress. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and so and so they did it. It was a very successful campaign for them, and you know you could start to see which influencers were really influencing sales because they were talking, they're putting in their house, they're they're already on Instagram, they're doing all these things, and that influencer, the cost to this big mattress company to give away a handful of free mattresses is really so small in the big scheme of things and all the professional photos that they got, if they had to pay the money to do that shoot themselves, it would have been tenfold. So I think just more to the point that you don't need to have a big following or be a big brand to have influence and to approach brands to partner with. Right. Don't tell anyone I told you that story though. <laughs> um, I was just gonna add to that from a client perspective. You, you hit the nail on the head in terms of you know the exposure and the content and whatnot. And I think if you're in the position that you're talking to brands um, about promoting their products in any way, keeping it as simple as possible and you know providing them with exactly what you're gonna do and how many times you're gonna post and what you, like what type of exposure you can give them will make their life easier. Um, and I used to actually work on Home Depot, so the Contra thing I'm very well versed in. And it used to just like, we'd make it rain Contra for like all the sponsors, like everybody got lumber, everybody got kitchens, that's all gone. And it's not even simply a function of just the cost of the product. The logistics on the back end for these clients, like they just don't have the manpower. It becomes a bit arduous in terms of like, how much do you need and where's it going? Where's it being shipped? And I think they've all just cut it out. I think at best, sometimes you might even just get a gift card now. And it's like certain retailers will say, here, here's a thousand bucks, like choose what you want. Anyway, that's my back end story. <laughs> Did you? Um. 
I think moving into the future for this industry, um, the things that the collective uh, has done by bringing designers, architects, developers into a forum or ha to have a platform to access different resources like my own, like different brands, is the way of the industry in the future. Um, having a, a resource that has access built in already to multiple brands that are niche specific will give either a young designer or a mature designer in, in the industry an avenue to start. And from there, you can build on the things that uh, Rebecca and Ritam and Jen have been talking about with the um, social media side of building the brand and partnering the brand. Um, I still think that we're a highly visual industry and you need to see, touch and feel and for a designer it's necessary to have a flat lay or, or something that you can see to take to your to take to your client before you know to partner with that brand that you want to partner with. So I think that, that uh, going if I'm going back to the question, Dwayne, is just simply these resources that are out there. Um, I think these are a great starting point uh, to position yourself as designers and architects and contractors to have access to these brands that they've already brought together in one place and and build from there. Yeah, I think collective team, Rocco, Cardi, you guys have a, you've done an amazing job at starting a conversation that for the new topics. Like I don't, I haven't seen any other association do this. And I think the, the kind of topics that you guys are putting together, designers that you're bringing together, the brands that you're bringing together, I think it's really important what is happening in Toronto. So, you know, great job. Like, it's amazing. You guys work really hard. They do. Um, Too hard. Um, thank you guys. Um, and I can speak to partnerships as well from being on the outside of the collective because I actually met the collective through a vendor hat last year. And oddly enough, I'm working for the collective this year. So um, partnering was part of what I was seeking out for the company I was with before. Um, when I came across uh, the collective, it was actually for a presentation with Mayo. Um, the company I used to work for represented them as well, but I saw such a great opportunity with the collective workspace, um, so much so that I kept badgering and hounding my boss because I realized the potential of partnerships because Again, to Stephen's point, it's, we are, we're designers, we're decorators, we're creative beings, and there's so many different um, great showrooms, great outlets for us to, to experience, but we don't have that opportunity. And what has been done with the collective is it's a, it's a resource center, it is a networking community, it's a great way to build, um, and that is really, <coughs> true to the partnership, excuse me, <laughs> bless you. Um, so it's, it's something to, there's something to be said about partnerships. I mean, the panel up here is representative of a partnership. Um, we all have come here as a partnership um, because we're in the industry together. And I think the future is gonna be changing, it's gonna be evolving. Who knows when the heck the pandemic's gonna end. Um, so having the partnerships, looking forward to the future of growing the design community is something that I'm passionate about and I, I love being a part of this network because we do have strong partners in the industry and um, you know, like Rebecca said, all of us are, in, are our own influencers and we don't need to have followings, we don't need to have all these different TV shows and all that stuff. but. We, we can make an impact and it really is through partnering with the right people and networking with the right people. So I wanna thank you guys. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor to questions. So 
If anybody has questions, oh, there we go. There's quite a few. Um, you guys can field them accordingly. Go ahead. Um, okay, so my question is, uh, you know, I, I'm on Instagram, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nano, nano, nano uh, influencer. Um, I already tag, when I put up a photo of a room I've done, a kitchen, for example, I have tagged my own. What would be the benefit or the, <coughs> what would, why would Mayo then say, oh no, I want to partner with you, I'm already doing it for them? Great point. Um, that, that's what I was mentioning. Should right? I that, stop doing it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think you should stop doing this. I think it's, you re, if you really like working with Mayo, as an example, and you tag their products, we notice it, right? Mm -hmm. And now if you approach us, we would 100% look into this and ask you, so what else can you do? And how can we turn this into a partnership? It is not, it is literally not about how many followers you have, it's about are you creating great content and do we have synergies and stories that we're trying to tell? Because at the end of the day, we are working together to reach the homeowners. Are we creating and living for these people, creating beautiful products, creating beautiful spaces. So how can we get together and reach more of these people? Right? So it's really about reaching out a brand and saying, well, I have been tagging you and now I also want to do all these different types of content for you guys. How can we you know, set something up. And I think like all these things are overwhelming. I mean, Rebecca is a pro, so she doesn't mind sending emails, cold emails, cold calling. She's okay, a <laughs> hold on a second. I hate cold calling emails, and I find it very uncomfortable. I hate asking people for favors or for anything, and I think that comes naturally to me as a woman, unfortunately. I do not always speak up, I'm working on it. We talked about this earlier, you know, in this industry, and this isn't answering your question, Kate, sorry, but I'm on a tangent again. In this industry, I think it's predominantly female, and a lot of the times we are afraid to step up and ask for things. And I mean, you see it in people looking for jobs. It's usually the man that will go and negotiate the salary, whereas the female will say, thank you very much, meanwhile they might be secretly resenting you. It's, I, mean, I know that I'm making a generalization, but it is something I see regularly within the design community, within creative female entrepreneurs, not charging enough for their services, right? Not asking enough. So I know there's people in this room who are like, I'm still never gonna go and ask a brand to partner with me, because that freaking scares you. But that has been me, it's very scary. I do have challenges with it. I have someone named Vera who helps me write the email. Because, I mean, there's people like, I wanted to partner with my own, and I'm like, well, I feel like if they wanted to partner with me, they would come to me. Literally, those are the thoughts that go through my head. So, nobody, I don't know if anybody does it seamlessly and easily unless you are in PR and that is your job. I think as the creative, sometimes it's very hard to bridge that gap. I think this is where, and this is why we create a guide. And the features that we are bringing to market is, you can easily put together a media kit, set your prices, understand how much you should be charging. And once your profile is up there and brands that are creating campaigns, you can join the campaigns and brands can invite you to campaigns. So you don't have to feel awkward asking for money, asking for collaboration, and it feels more seamless because everything has been done by, with this beautiful technology. And we love, I love technology. It makes our life easier. Can I have one thing to the question? Sorry. I was just going to say, um, in terms of the question, like, should I tag them or should I not, it also helps you create a bit of a, a, an engagement story. So let's say you've done 10 tags of, I don't know, um, an appliance company, and you saw a good engagement. You don't have a million followers, but that's okay. You had highly engaged followers. You put that in your sales pitch to them. You show them, you know, I did these 10 posts, and look at all the engagement we got. I think there's an opportunity, and then that might open the door. I think you could also create content without a partnership or a brand. Like for example, if you love Mayo's product, why not do a reel and highlight how hardware is the jewelry of the kitchen, right? And tag Mayo, and then you can approach them or another brand and say, hey, look, I'd love to partner you with you. This is the type of work I've done with Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mayo. <laughs> I love all the name drops. You are really, really, really <laughs> a lot of PR. And, 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 farmhouse, I don't know. Oh, that's coming up, looking for sustainably sourced and all the rest. <laughs>
So, you know, like, I think this is where, like, I would say Gaiden is something that you should look into, you know, Gaiden.co, check it out. Set up your media kits, and I think that is how you can start getting into the market. And I forgot what I was about to say. The tag thing is tricky, I will, I will say, Kate. I find it very tricky. Sometimes I don't tag all my vendors because if I am partnering with certain brands, then why, to your point, why would I give away like all this PR, free PR for another brand when this other, when this, when Mayo is partnering with me? Like I do, I personally do struggle with that. I don't have the answer. No, that's valid. That's yeah. definitely valid. Because <laughs> if I'm paying you and I'm like, wait a second, you're giving it. It's just either I think they're also paying you or it's even worse if you're giving it to them for free, but I'm paying you. So I think you really need to be careful about navigating it. And that kind of goes back to, you need a content strategy and a map of how it all works. And I think that if you do a read, right? And if you like the content, we would want it. We want to repurpose it. We want to use it on different channels. You did that? No, no, oh. I, I heard you did that. I'm like, what? How do I miss that? <laughs> okay. There were a couple of other hands I saw. Uh, yep, go ahead. So I just want to circle back to your last question, which was like where the industry is going with influencers. So I work for House of Home, he used to work with Jen, and I am both sides, because I am the video producer for our YouTube content, but I am also sometimes the host or the influencer who has to talk about brands. And as a person who has to speak directly with brands and building that script, I, I think the most important thing is authenticity. And I, I know there are at least three of us on TikTok here. Follow both of you. But you have a really good TikTok, though, by the way. You should follow <laughs> Rachel Karen on TikTok. So I think we really see that on TikTok, right? There was a huge flood of eyeballs going there because it's authentic. There's no more Photoshopping. There's none of this like fake life that exists on Instagram. And the new generation is really into that. Yeah. So brands who want to speak to that younger generation, you have to, you have to work with that direction. You have to be able to get your message across in a really like appealing, like girl next door, like your best friend is telling you a vacuum to buy kind of way, not in telling your company's history and, you know? Yeah. There's like a real balance there. And as a person who has had to like talk, marketing talk, to get that brand what they wanted, I can tell you from the back end of seeing the results on YouTube, it doesn't work anymore. Like you have to be authentic and you have to find a way to not cram those people with information that feels like a sales pitch. Yeah, I would actually say that if you do get to the point of having discussions about partnerships, hashing that out in advance of producing anything is vital. Because, and I mean, Rayco, we've been in the situation, you know, things get produced and the client sees what is supposed to be a final draft and they're not happy because you didn't say X, Y, and Z, but we didn't know you needed to say X, Y, and Z. No one told us that. And it, and then you're trying to align, you know, your vision for from an editorial standpoint and your audience and your brand, and they had expectations on their end. And often, when you're working with a brand, depending on the size of the team, you know, you could be dealing with multiple stakeholders. So getting it all in writing, again, it goes back to the strategy and the map, <laughs> and having everything organized will just create a more seamless output. I think what's your TikTok? Sorry, what's your TikTok? Oh, it's my name, Mariko Karan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Goose, she's got she's got an influencer dog, guys. She's she's downplaying the channel. Are you micro or nano? <laughs> oh, she's macro. I yeah, yeah. But as House and Home, we have a huge voice, and a lot of the people like Kitchen Cabinets partner with us, and they're really, I guess they're a bit more old school, and they're used to broadcast, and they want to get that whole story and marketing pitch across and it's just falling flat because no one wants to be told what to do and no one wants to feel like they've got a snake oil, oil salesman you know you have to talk like like you're their best friend and sometimes that means getting less information across great point mm -hmm. great point yeah. thank you yeah. i think a younger generation millennials like we are watching our friends that is true you know on referrals on tiktok and youtube podcast, Instagram, and we don't watch TV, and we don't see, you know, some lady pop up in a TV ad selling a couch. 
That, that's, that's what I remember on TV as. Like, like I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's where it is. And I think brands are just taking a little longer in our industry to, you know, understand that. But we are hoping to change that. And maybe we should talk. Yeah. How, how's it normally guy who can change this together? Anybody else? I think there are a couple more in the back. So my question is like in the future perspective, when one partner finds the other partner like action does not meet their uh, financial goal or uh, their plan, what other like risk or conflict that would be uh, happening? <coughs> so what would we what would we do when the plan is not following as expected? Well, I can talk about that. Um, so again, it goes back to kind of mapping everything out in a contract, like something legally binding. Often as a partner or brand, if you don't deliver what you say you're going to deliver, um, I mean, I think the simplest way is brands usually ask for a make good. So if you didn't deliver a set number of um, impressions or exposures for the type of content you produced, you know, they might ask you to produce something else or repost it or re-promote it. I think worst case scenario, sometimes brands will like, I'm not gonna say they won't pay their bills, it depends on the scale, but I think you have to keep in mind like you've agreed you're gonna deliver something, um, and if it doesn't happen, it essentially brings you back to a renegotiation. I can say that that's my greatest fear, is not being able to deliver on the promise, and I probably weekly have this conversation with my marketing coordinator, Vera, who you ladies know, and I'm like, what are we, where are we at? Like, do we, do we like, let's look at like all these partners, like have we delivered, did we give them the photos, like what else? Because everyone has a different contract and, and some brands require certain things and like exclusivity or a certain number of Instagram posts or a story or uh, a YouTube or, and sometimes bigger brands, they need to okay the post before you've done the post which for me stresses me out because I'm kind of like, if I've seen my pants, I'm like, I feel it in the moment and it's on social. So for me, I, 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 that this is a whole new process for me. We have to put together what's the story gonna be, send it to their PR company, do you approve of this? You get the, I, my fear is not, not coming through on my end because we get busy too, right? It's like, oh yeah, right, I have to post about that product and I'm so afraid of letting that brand down. I was just going to say sometimes also you'll have legal teams like it, it depending on the type of product it is no seriously no pressure. and they have to vet it they'll want a storyboard like yeah it can be very involved yeah any other questions yes um so this one's for jennifer so how do you get your work to be featured in a magazine like how would it help comment no comment um, I, um, I mean, that is the million dollar question that I think anyone that has an home has always been asked. How do you get your work featured? You know what, I don't even know what the magic answer is to that. I know a lot of it is relationship building, you know, building your audiences, your exposure. Um, there are certain connections within house and home, you know, and I can't tell you who they are because I'll get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> like, but Rayco can tell you. No, I'm kidding. Um, but the, it's a lot of it's relationship building, quite honestly. Like, don't get me wrong. There are opportunities where it's sheer exposure and, you know, someone has seen you and they'll reach out. But I think a lot of the times it's networking. You know, being part of the collective is an excellent opportunity because you meet so many different people from so many different areas who have connections across the industry. I, I'm actually surprised the question is still how do we get published in the magazine and not on their digital channels? You mean as a brand, yeah. though, like anywhere, right? Yeah. yeah. Talk to Rico about video. <laughs> I, I will tell you, I've never once been featured in House at Home magazine, but I have done videos, and I think the return on that is far greater because that video is still there live. You can go check. I did a few videos with them. Uh, they do such a great, their production quality is incredible, and they, 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 they tag me. I think even link to me, maybe. I hope I think you do. Yes, you link back to my website. So it helps with the SEO, and I can reshare that at any time, and, and anyone can go and watch it. It's not like, oh, go, no offense to magazines, but it's, who's gonna go get a back issue of House and Home um, to see that kitchen feature? I mean, you have a PDF. So I do think there's a lot of value to Rhythm's point. The industry is changing, but I think the thing is designers, we still really like print media. And there's still something about the glossy pages of a magazine and seeing your space on those pages. I, I think maybe 
we need to start looking at social media as those, how to make that glossier. That's where the eyeballs are. And recycling paper is. <laughs> I see what you're doing. <laughs> hundred percent perfect in everything you do even though I love the environment I do like magazines you have like wine on keto diet what <laughs> no I'm not on a keto diet diet <laughs> this is coming from somewhere um I think everything in moderation but I to answer your question too about getting published because I've been published in other magazines um not in house and home it is relationships from what I've seen. It's also a little bit, and I'll say it because I'm not affiliated with any magazine, it's a little bit of pay to play. Um, so what that means is if, if, um, if you're working with a brand partner, for example, and they're paying to have an advertisement in the magazine, then your work might get featured through them. Also, people who work with publicists, um, if you work with a publicist, you know, you're paying that person to get you featured, that publicist has connections or might have a product company that's advertising in the magazine and they have leverage. It's a lot more complicated than just having great work. Because there's so many designers that have such great work and have never been published. That's legitimate. The pay to play is 100% legitimate. If you can align yourself with brands that have entrenched relationships and at, when, when you're there, like big advertising budgets, you kind of get to ride um, their coattails on that front. Anybody else? No? Going once, <laughs> twice. You stand by one dollar. <laughs> I have a question for the audience. Sure. How many of you, after today, are going to go and ask for brand partnerships from anyone in your life? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I didn't know how many hands were going to go up. That's really great. That is great. And it's great to see that, um, you know, today's talk was something that's inspiring for all of us. Um, and I'm glad each of you were here. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. If anybody has any other questions, um, you can grab one of the panelists after. We do have um, some water, some wine, some snacks and refreshments on the bar for you guys. So. Thank you once again. And no, we'll give it to and I was gonna say, <laughs> Carly is just reminding me that we are gonna do a tour. Um, you can grab Christine. That's another brand partnership. Yes. Right? What? The tour of the whole place. I'm guessing that's a partnership with TIDC? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so just if Christine, if you can raise your hand. She's at the front desk. Rocco and Carly, if you can raise your hand. And obviously, all of you know me. So if any of you would like to see our space down the hall, um, it is under construction, just fair warning. Uh, but it's clean. <laughs> and just let us know if we can walk you down the hall to show you the space. We also do have um, a rendering that's on loop in the space so you can get a sense of what it's going to unfold. Like It's pretty, pretty impressive. So. I would encourage all of you to take a walk down with one of us, okay? Thank you again well, can for- Can I say one more thing, Dwayne? No, we're no, back I up. Shut up. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I just wanted to let everybody know, I forgot to mention it. I'm hosting a, a workshop next week. Uh, it's a photography-based uh, workshop. It's about getting your photographs done and working to get published. And I, I'm hosting it with Mike Kajetsky, who's an interiors photographer in the city, as well as Margot Austin, formerly of House and Home and other magazines. They're both going to be uh, teaching and sharing, we're going to share all the knowledge that we have on how to run a smooth and successful interiors photo shoot, the do, what to do, what not to do, and then what you can do in that shoot to help get you published. So if you guys want to check that out, you can go to my website, RebeccaA.com. That's next Tuesday from 10 till 1. That's it, thanks. You're welcome, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you guys.